Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's give Jesus a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Jesus. Woo. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Everybody can hear me okay? We're good? Good. So, the Lord, he's so amazing. And he's made you amazing. You know that? And so, um, I'm going to open up. I'm going to read a scripture and then open up in prayer, okay? Um, I, it's hard for me to, like, pick a title sometimes because I feel like there's so much. But I, I would call this Good Leaders Love. And I'm going to read from Proverbs 20, 28 in the Passion. Proverbs 20, 28. And I'm just going to read it and go into prayer. So if, you don't have to turn there for this one, okay? It says, Good Leadership is built on love and truth. For kindness and integrity are what keep leaders in their position of trust. Amen? And so, Father, right now, in your beautiful name, God, in your presence, which changes the atmosphere, which moves in situations, which opens doors, your beautiful presence, which is inside of each one of us, God, each one of your sons and daughters, I thank you that we are the house of God. And because we are here tonight, you are here tonight. I thank you that you are not only willing to move, but that you want to move that you want to speak to us, that you are always speaking through objects, through people, through situations, through the teaching and preaching, through the worship, through the skies, through everything that you've made, you're always speaking, and tonight our ears are open. We are open to what you have to say, Lord Jesus. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you will have your way through every imperfection. You make it perfect. Through every part that's just me and not you, you still use it, God. You still use it because your blood is what qualifies us. And I thank you, God, that your people will be built up, edified, God, that they will be encouraged to walk out the word. Because the word is not just a lot of talk, but it is really living in power. It is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. And I thank you, God, that you are love and that your love will be made known tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 My name is Joelle, as you heard, and I am 34. I'm going to be 35 this month. <laughs> um, I, have, I, I graduated the women's program here at the Lighthouse in 2011. Woo! Amen? Uh, it's been a long road. I, I, I ran back to some of the same places and people thinking that I could get a different result. I did experience the Lord's voice. I experienced change when I was here. But Jesus wasn't Lord of my decisions yet. And so I wanted to go make things happen quickly. I didn't listen to the Spirit of God. And in going to make things happen without that being what God was leading me to do, I believe it opened the door for me to be exposed to things that I wasn't ready to be exposed to yet. And so I ended up relapsing within seven months of graduating the women's program. And uh, two years down a very dark, I mean, way worse than it was before the first time I came. Way worse. I ended up on heroin, I ended up on methamphetamines, I ended up losing uh, my children a second time. Um, it, it was just bad. I, I was almost killed multiple times and just, it was a really low place. And I don't need to go into detail to tell you that um, I, I wanted to be dead. I, I didn't even want to live anymore. I was at the point where I had hoped that when I went to sleep on the heroin that I wouldn't wake up. And so when I came back here, and by the way, some people might think that two times means it doesn't work, but I'm here to say, why would you come back to something that doesn't work? <laughs> why would you come running back to something that doesn't work? So don't look at that and be discouraged. Look at that and be encouraged that people are willing to come back to a place that shows there must be something, right? And so when I came back, I was so broken. 
And the spirit of love is what changed me. The spirit of love is what has drawn me to change my ways, to be open to change my entire walk with the Lord. For me, it started in the faith home. But for all of us, it started the moment we began to develop a relationship with the Lord. So just because I'm from the faith home doesn't mean that this doesn't apply to everybody. At some point, the Spirit of God came in and we had an encounter with love and it drew us. We were facing this way and we were like, we, we had to turn towards it. Because the love of God turns a man to, to repentance. Amen. What draws us to change is love. So, did you know that as believers we're actually commanded to love? Yes. Oh, yeah. So what drew us in was the love of God. Yeah. What keeps us is the love of God. Starts here with me and God can't love my neighbor if I'm not in love with God and if I don't receive his love, right? So we're actually commanded to love. Let's turn to John 13, 34 and 35. Passion translation. Love is the law. Love is the law of the new covenant. Love is our law as new covenant believers. We are commanded to love. John 13, 34, and 35 in the Passion Translation. So I give you now a new commandment. Love each other just as much as I have loved you. For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you're my true followers. When you demonstrate the same love I have for you, my daughters, my sons, when you demonstrate the love I've shown you, then the world will know that you're my true followers. It says, when you demonstrate the same love I have for you. how Think about what that means. What kind of love has God, show, God showed us? Well, first of all, he's super forgiving. I mean... I don't know what your relationships with the Lord are like, but I know for me, when I go to be like, God, I'm sorry about something, or like, you know, apologize. I don't like to call myself sorry, but when I go to apologize to the Lord, and like, I'm like, God, I know that you forgive me, but I just want to say, I, I, can't, I, I, I can't even get the words out of my mouth. It's like he hushes me, and he's on, like, man. stop. You're already forgiven. Ah, on, I love you. And in those moments, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh, I realize that he's nothing like us. His ways are so much higher, but the thing is that we're actually called to be like that. We're actually called when someone slaps us to turn the other cheek because the world taught us ojo por ojo, diente por diente, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But that's not the way of the Lord, and it's not the way that he treats us. So what happens is, First of all, I just want to tell you that three different scriptures talk about love being the new commandment for us as new covenant believers. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Matthew 7, 12. Romans 13, 8 through 10. And I'll say those again. And that's on top of John 13, 34 through 35. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. This is just to let you know that this isn't just a good idea. The word is actually speaking that our law is now love. Matthew 7, 12, Romans 13, 8 through 10. We're going to go to Romans 13, 8 through 10. Romans 13, 8 through 10. The way, as you're turning there, I'm going to talk. The way that the world knows we are true followers of the Lord is by our love one for another. Does that mean that we never get impatient? No. Does that mean that we never have something that we go, listen, you know, I handled that wrong. Please forgive me. No, in fact, 
Another way we know someone's a true follower is when they're, when they're willing to come back and be like, you know, I was wrong. I handled that wrong. I could have handled that better. It's just another indicator that love is what's ruling that person. It doesn't mean we're always going to get it right, but we're quick to, to make it right, to seek peace, to pursue it, to maintain it. So in Romans 13, 8 through 10, I'm actually going to read from the ESV. Do you guys have that? Okay, so here I would rather you listen because it's a little different than the other versions, and you'll get what I'm trying to say if you hear this version, okay? This is the ESV, Romans 13, 8 through 10. It says, no, owe no one anything except love, except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Who has fulfilled the law? The one who loves another. The one who fulfills the law is the one who does everything perfect? And no, is it the one who's always striving to get everything right? No, because somebody can be really in order on the outside and striving to get everything right and still miss love. It's the one that loves that has fulfilled the law. To continue, it says, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love the, your neighbor as yourself. All of the law is summed up in one word, and that is love. Love, <laughs> love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. I want to tell you that the choice to love is better. Do you know that love is a choice? Yeah. It's not a feeling. We can get goosebumps and good feelings and not actually be walking in love towards a person. Can't go by our feelings. Love is a choice. Love is a decision. Love is a commitment. Love is an act of the will. I am going to do this because I choose to. And if you think about it, look at the Olympic trainers. And I use this as an analogy with the um, Faith Home students a lot when I'm teaching. The willpower that they have to train for the Olympics is it blows my mind. I struggle with wanting a juicy cheeseburger when I'm out every time. It's just like, you know, I can imagine the willpower it takes to do the training that they do. Yet, take the spirit out of it. That's just willpower. Not all of them are saved, and look at what they accomplish. Us, as believers, we have the resurrection power of God inside of us. We have Holy Spirit who has made a home in our hearts. And if we will let him fill up every room, if we will let him invade every area, then he will empower us to love in every situation. The power's there. We just don't know to believe for it. Or maybe that intimacy with him, which is what's going to fuel us, maybe we need to stir that up a little bit. And it's okay. It happens to all of us. It happens to all of us. The choice to love is better. I want to point out that in Proverbs 15, 17, he says it's much better to have a kind, loving family, even with little, than to have great wealth. It's better to have a kind and loving family and have barely anything than it is to have wealth. Oh, my gosh. It says in Proverbs 16, 8, it's better to have a little with a heart that loves justice than to be rich and not have God on your side. I know for me, when God called me um, to work with the ladies, I, I didn't know um, that I was going to be asked to work with them. I wanted to, but I hadn't voiced that to any of the leadership here. God knew that, right? Also, I had been praying for a heart of love to be working with the ladies for probably about a year at that point, solid. Just, Lord, let whoever is in the realm of influence have that heart of love. I had no clue that God was going to open the door for me to step into that position. And I'm not saying that in a prideful way. He did it. I didn't ask for it. God called me. So I'm not saying that to brag on me, but I'm saying that that heart of love, that heart that, you know what, I'm going to give one more chance. I love that our pastor, our president, our senior pastor, Pastor Tony, he is gracious. He gives second and third and fourth and fifth chances. I love that because that's the heart of the Lord. Think about how many chances we've had. Think about how gracious he is to us. 
Why wouldn't we want to display that heart to others? Why wouldn't we? It's better to be kind than it is to have riches. In, in 1 Corinthians 13, and we're not going to go there, I'm just going to point out some things, that the choice for love is better because he says that it, we can speak eloquently, yet if we don't have love, our words are reduced to the hollow sound of nothing. So we can speak wise words, but then when people see us act out of love, do those words mean anything at that point? I'm inclined to believe that sometimes our words carry weight, even if we're lovers or not, but it's when people see the actions after the words that they know whether or not those words were true. We're always on display as believers. The reason I call this good leaders love is because you're all leaders. Every one of you is called to be a leader. Whether you're walking into the gas station door, you take charge of that atmosphere. You are a leader in that building in that moment. It doesn't matter if you run the store or not. You walk in there with the authority of heaven backing you up, with the love of the kingdom of God on the inside of you. You are a leader in that store when you walk in the door. Young people, when you're in school, you're a leader. It doesn't matter if your voice is heard. It doesn't matter if you're popular. You're an example to every person around you. Why? Because they see you, because they hear you. So it doesn't matter. You're a leader, whether you're in the position of leadership or not. You're, you are seen and heard by everyone around you. They can't help but see you and hear you. So you go in their eye gates and you go in their ear gates, whether they want to see you or not. So you tell me, doesn't that mean you're a leader of some sort? Raise your hand if you have children that you somehow affect in your life or are around in any way, shape, or form. Right. Think about when you're at the grocery store. Do you know that kids see everything? You may not even be a parent, but you're on your phone talking. Guess what? That conversation is heard. We just forget because we're in the bubble. <laughs> we're in the bubble. We get into what we're doing. So that means if you're complaining, if you're doing all this stuff, it, it's heard. But imagine when you're rolling next to the a, a child with their mom and they're bored, so they're listening to everything around them and they hear some life come out of your mouth. Or you encouraging someone on the phone. You know, we don't think about how in, in those little moments we really are examples still. You are leaders. I want you to think about what happens if you don't love. There are some consequences to not loving. Um, oh, I, I kind of did go over that um, in 1 Corinthians 13. Um, your words... They might carry weight for a moment, but when we are not lovers of people, those words become clinging symbols. They do. Um, the other thing is that we can prophesy and have even revelation from God, but it actually says word for word that I'm nothing without love. It also says I can give everything away and gain nothing of value. So that just goes to show you, if a kind family is better than wealth, and if I can give everything away but gain nothing if I'm not a lover, then there must be something to this love walk because the value that God places on people and the value that God places on the act and choice of love is so high that it is our commandment in the new covenant. We are commanded to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love others. The value that God places on love is so incredibly high that he is love. God is love. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So the value that God places on love is absolutely at the highest. It should be the very thing that we shoot for. Do you know that if you shoot for love above everything else, all the other stuff you're chasing will begin to be added to you? Why? Because it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And according to Paul, there's two scriptures that explain the kingdom. One is the kingdom of God is not just a bunch of talk, but it is living by the power of God. Number two... Righteous, it, the kingdom of God is love, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. So if we're seeking first the kingdom and we're seeking love first, all else will be added. I will say one of the things about being in a small community, I wrote a paper on this in my second year of college, in being part of a small community is like flaws are on front, front street. Okay, they are, right? Yeah. 
So we got to choose to look past them. When you go to a larger church, a lot of times you can just be like, hey, okay, bye, and that's it. You don't really know. Everything's not all out on the table. Now, just the, for those of you who don't know, in the faith home, your stuff's really on the table because they, they're with each other morning, noon, and night. So it's a little bit extreme and out of the normal circumstances. But even here at the Lighthouse, because we are a smaller church, it's just our flaws go out there. Man, if you talk a little too loud to somebody, people hear it down the hallway, around the corner, before you know it, Bob's talking about it, John's talking about it, whatever. I'm just saying, like, our flaws are on Front Street with a small community. But there's also something so amazing to that. If you will be open to change and correction, if you will allow God to love on you and allow you to, and if you will seek loving people, you will change way faster than everybody else going to the churches with no friction. We can actually be grateful for the struggle because there is benefit in it. There's growth in it. There's maturity in it. We learn how to love ourselves and love our brothers with a selfless love, with a love that is like the Lord's love for real. We learn that love is a choice. It's, you know what, you said it that way and I'm going to look right over it and smile and love you anyways. It, it means I can mess up and be a little bratty and still treat everybody exactly the same and still and still continue to love myself in those moments of letdown and still continue to seek peace and pursue it and maintain it. Because there's two sides to this. We have to forgive ourselves and let, let our own mistakes go in this love walk. And we also have to choose to look past the faults of others. Um, there's some benefits to this love walk. It says in Proverbs 22.4 that laying down your life in tender surrender before the Lord will bring life, prosperity, and honor as your reward. Some of us are fighting for honor. Do you know that some of us are fighting for our own honor? We want to be honored so bad that we'll fight for it, that we'll jab somebody else who's getting attention. It's maybe without realizing it, but it's like a, this, we want to be honored. But the Lord says laying down your life in tender surrender will bring life, prosperity, and honor as your reward. Honor is your reward in laying down your life. Some of us, have you ever, okay, if anybody says no to this, <laughs> have you ever, haven't we all faced a situation where we were sure that we were sure that we were sure that we were sure that it was like this and this person was this. And it wasn't until afterwards that we found out, oh, my God, we were totally wrong. Our perspective was wrong, and it was nothing like what we thought. But it was so real in the moment. Yeah. One thing that has happened with me over the last um, almost five years is I've been around a lot of ladies, but I've somewhat operated in conflict resolving. Without asking for that, it's a huge part of working with a group of women. Uh, conflict, re I'm serious. Um, and, and I'm sure with the men too, you know, I just don't happen to work with them like that. But it's a huge part of working with a small group home where people are together all the time. But I will tell you that in investigating situations, because I don't react ever when stuff's brought to me, we talk, we talk, we talk, we talk, we talk, I listen, I hear, and then I respond from a place of where the Spirit's leading me. But in my talking and investigating, I find out that four people can be in the, the same room and have experienced the same situation, and each four people completely remember it different, completely sure that they remembered it how they heard it, and there's just, and they're all 100% right. Do you know that? I had one young lady say, how could you believe me and her? I said, because you were both in the room and you both experienced it your own way. And I believe her and I believe you. Yep. Why? Because it was so real to her and so real to her. And I say that to say that we need to open our minds to the fact that we cannot judge what is inside somebody's head accurately. The word says we don't even know ourselves accurately. It is God that knows us. So if you will throw off. Now, I want to say this. Strongholds come down, but it says that we take 
every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So we must stop thinking this way. And what I'm going to tell you is it's nobody, it's not your business what anybody else thinks about you. And you've got to stop thinking you know what people are thinking. Because we get it wrong. Think about how you change your mind five times in a day sometimes. Like, it's like we're so irritated with somebody. It's like, oh, wait, no. Then they say something sweet, and you're like, oh, okay, I love you. You know, but how quick can we change? So why can't we give somebody else the grace to change their mind that quick? Or to be up one minute and down the next, right? It's so true. It's so true. So we don't owe anyone Anything except for love. That's what we owe each other. That's what's going to change the city of Tampa. That's what's going to change the community of Riverview. That's what's going to change the state of Florida. It's when the lovers of God step up and they are pressed and crushed by offense and persecution and opposition. And what comes out is love. That's it. Think about the early church. In Acts. Actually, I was going to read this last, but let me, let me just say this really quick. This is good. I, I read sometimes blogs, and this particular blog says, Is the church breeding loneliness? This particular person, Rosaria Butterfield, answers yes. She believes we have declared independence from each other in our culture and sadly in our churches. Once upon a time, the church was of one heart and soul, and no one said any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Does anybody know when that was? That was the early church in Acts. That was the first, that was the birth of the church. They were one heart, one soul. No one said anything's just mine. They shared everything. They fellowshiped. They prayed together. They laughed together. And it said, it says in Acts, you can look it up later yourself. I don't know the verse, but I know the word. It says in Acts that their unity they were in such unity that God added to their numbers daily. It is the love of God and the unity that people encounter that is going to draw people in. Are we in it for numbers? No, but don't you want your life to prove that he's real? Don't you want people to be like, oh, my God, I just saw Jesus today. Where, where, did, where did I hear this? I was listening to something. Was it last night? I don't know. But I've been feeding so much. It's like, don't you want someone to leave your presence being like, wow, I feel better. Wow. I could totally mess up with that person, and they're not going to treat me any different. That was the cry in my heart five years ago when I came back to the Lord. I said, Lord, I want to be consistent. I just want to be not up one day, down the next. I want to be here tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow forever. And I want people to know that we can go through stuff, and guess what? It's still going to be there. Why? Because that's how he was to me. He came and kissed my arms while they were covered in bloody junkie scars. I wept in the dining room over in the Faith Home Chapel services because the love of God wrapped me so tight and told me that he'd pay more, he paid more for me than anybody else ever would. And when you're somebody that had settled on amounts for your value... And God says something like that, oh, oh, my God. I tangibly heard his voice and felt his love that night. Nobody can take that away from me. And you know when you're going to have encounters like that is when you shut everything off in your home and turn on the worship music and start to have a love relationship with the Spirit of God. Everything we're talking about is great, but if you want to love others, it's not going to happen until you have that relationship with the Lord. How can you get gossiped about and not gossip? Oh, my gosh, Miss Joe, you, you're always the same. I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just saying that is told to me. So how could that be told to me? I don't know. Because the Spirit of God has changed me on the inside. Because he empowers me. Because it's not of me. It's of him. But he's in me, and so it is me. It's me and him and him and me. I want to cancel out a lie really quick. And, and I'm so glad the Spirit of God showed this to me today when I was stu like just studying extra because this is stuff I've been feeding on, but today I was extra feeding. And so how many have believed, like, oh, God, I could love them, but it's just too hard? So hard to love them, right? We 
think that sometimes, right? But I'm going to show you in the word where it says it's not a burden to love others. And you will not allow yourself that excuse anymore. Can you imagine Jesus Christ saying, eh, I'll just like him. I won't love him. I, I don't have to, this is what I meant. I don't have to like her. I don't have to like Evelyn. I'll just love her. Can you imagine Jesus saying that? So why would we say it when we are supposed to be followers of Jesus? I know this may seem extreme from what you've heard before, but I refuse to settle for the lie that I only have to like someone when I am supposed to be love on this earth. When I'm supposed to be the Jesus that somebody sees so that they can turn away and be connected to their father, how can I settle for that? I can't. And I hope that this just stirs you for something more. I don't, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. But we can sure reach for the calling that we've been called and run the race with passion. There is a fight of faith. And if you don't know what you can reach for, how can you reach for it? You can't. So reach for love and don't settle for anything less anymore. 1 John 5, 1 through 3. I'm going to read it from the ESV. 1 John 5, 1 through 3. Maybe try NIV. May, I don't know what would be similar. But I'm going to read it from ESV. 1 John 5, 1 through 3. It says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves only some who have been born of him. No. It says everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. It continues to say, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. What did we learn the commandments are all fulfilled in? Love. love. How do we fulfill the law? Love, one for another. And it, the last part of the verse, his commands are not burdensome. So wait a second. I can't, I can't call loving somebody a burden anymore? Nope. It's not burdensome if I'm believing right. Our problem is always rooted in not right believing. Our problem is always rooted in not realizing that we've been empowered to do all things. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Isn't love included in all? Isn't love included in all? So we can love through Christ who strengthens us. It does not have to be a burden. In fact, you can be slapped in the face, talked about, gossiped, misunderstood. But who understands you completely? Jesus. Who did you wake up for this morning? Jesus. Right. If I didn't wake up for Cecil, can Cecil uh, ruin my whole day? No. In fact, he could come in and slam the door, be mean. But guess what? My day is not going to be ruined over it. Will I be like, oh my gosh, what's going on, you know? Honestly, I would probably take a moment to be like, something's going on with him. Yeah. Lord, how can I be a blessing to him instead of thinking about how it affected me? A lot of times when somebody's in a bad mood, they've come from something hard at home. It allows you to have compassion on people when you take it to the spirit of God, not your coworkers. Amen. None of my coworkers have heard me say anything about what I've been through this week. As far as mistreatment, have I faced stuff? Absolutely. But what is the solution in sharing that with somebody who can't carry the solution? None. There is none. Now, I'll say this. As leaders and in the body, you know, Jesus stood up for injustice. Yes. I will absolutely stand up for mistreatment and injustice in a solution-oriented manner. You're not going to hear nothing about it. Only the person that can do something about it will hear about it. Does that make sense? It's, a, it's something that I teach the ladies in the faith home. There was a time where I believe too much was talked about when it came to them. Too much knew what was going on in their lives. And I'm so grateful that really you guys don't know a whole lot about them until they start finishing. and they can Because it needs to be covered. They need to be covered in love. We don't need to be talking about everybody else and what's going on and what they're struggling with. We need to be calling the gifts out in each other and talking about how, much, how far they've come and, and how, how we can be a blessing to each other. 
so that the people that walk in these doors can sense the family that we have here in God. So no more settling for the lie that it's too hard to love somebody, right? Yeah. Say, I am, I am empowered, empowered to love. To love. I, will I will love, love because, because I, am love. I am love. Because love, because love lives in me. Lives in me. Love, love is the answer. Yes. Amen. Just a quick statement in Proverbs 10, 12, it says, love draws a veil over every insult. You can pull that up in the Passion. Love draws a veil over every insult, and it finds a way to make sin disappear. That means when in somebody insults me, I let love cover that thing. Hmm. I think that probably a lot of the girls that are in the internship now could testify to this, but one thing that we talk about is looking past flaws and faults. Right, girls? We talk about seeing past that stuff, and I want you to know that that sight is only going to come from the Spirit of God. I want you to know from the bottom of my heart and through working with women hand in hand the last five years with the Spirit of God leading it, that like 98% of the time people genuinely feel bad about what they do. They genuinely want to change and they don't know how. They genuinely do not realize how their behavior affects other people. And we are so quick to judge them and we don't realize that God is trying to heal them from something they went through in their childhood. And once that healing takes place, it will manifest in behavior. We're so busy bashing for behavior that we don't realize God's trying to get to the root of a thing and cause inner healing. Once the inner healing takes place, behavior will change. But we're so busy bashing everybody that we're like saying, what, God, sorry, you want to heal them, but I'm ready for them to change now because it's affecting me. I mean, that's really what we're saying. We don't realize we're saying that, but that's really what we're saying. We're saying, God, I'm tired of dealing with this. You need to change them now. But God is saying, don't you want them to be changed forever? You bash behavior modification into somebody, it's only an outward change. Then what happens when they face trial and tribulation? They revert right back to the same behavior. We want inward transformation by the Spirit of God. Love is the beautiful prize for which we run. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. First Corinthians 13, 13 in the Passion. The last line says, above all else, let love be the beautiful prize for which you run. It is love that changed this heroin addict, meth addict, and, and, and turned my life around, filled me up on the inside. And let me just tell you, I can be at home alone. I can, in, in a long season of singleness, completely content in the wait for my children and custody battles, which are still going on five years later. The Spirit of God and the love of God are what has held me firm. Nothing else. Nothing else. There's so many tastes in this world for so many things. The only thing that satisfies is the Spirit of God and intimacy with Him and the love that is developed there. I'm going to... I, You guys, if we are saying, I, if I just finish this, then I'll, then I'll love. If I just get this person out of the way, then, then I'll really be able to love. If I just change jobs, then I'll, then I'll be okay. If I just move into a new place, then, then I'll, I'll be okay. If, if you change this, God, then I'll be okay. That's the wrong focus. God is trying to say, I can make you okay in the middle of what you're going through. And until we can be okay in our right now season, it's not time for the next season. In fact, sometimes we push for that next season and God gives it to us 
Because we can ask for things and he'll give them to us. But a lot of times, if we don't become okay in the middle of what we're facing and begin to rely on the Spirit of God to make us squeeze him out in spite of what we're going through, if we move before that takes place, we move too soon. There really is a place of being okay in the midst of whatever you're going through. It means this morning I wake up and I'm alive in Christ. It means, you know what, and I say this so carefully, but let's just say something happened to one of my parents. That would be hard to go through, but do you know that I would be okay in the Lord? I'm serious. And I am blessed and not cursed. I have no fear in saying that. In fact, that's faith. It's not a test. My parents are covered and protected and guarded and surrounded by angels. I'm not saying that in any woohoo kind of way. I'm being real with you. That when trouble comes, we need to know, God, you know what? I love my children. I love my spouse. I love my family. But if they were gone tomorrow, would I be okay? And if not, you need to do whatever you need to do in me so that I will be okay. So that this can be so real that even if I'm faced with death, I will scream your name. I want it to be that real. That even if I'm faced with persecution for real, that I will still say the name of Jesus. So what are we doing? What are we doing getting mad over the little stuff? There's people really struggling out there. Just fighting to get one page of a Bible to somebody. Just one page. Crossing lines of countries and facing death. To get just some words. And we have it at our fingertips. We have Bible apps and Facebook feeds and Instagram feeds and everything else and YouTube and each other. And we can live freely and worship freely and talk about it freely. We should be so pumped up about this walk and so encouraged and so built up. Wake up to love. Wake up to love. It's the only answer. It's the way the world will know that Jesus is real. If you feel like you need to be built up and edified and prayed for, the prayer team will pray with you. I'm not going to make an altar call for change because the Spirit of God empowers you to transformation every day. The renewing of the mind takes place every day. Your mind is continually being renewed. As you surrender to this and as you face situations this week, I urge you as you're faced with offense, I urge you to remember this. I urge you to spend time with the presence of God so that you reflect his love. But remember what I said about people not, when people are mean, look past it. You absolutely have the power to do that. When people mistreat us or when we mistreat people, they can do the same thing. We have the power to really love and to look past actions and see the people the way God sees them. Prayer team, if you would come up. John, if you would put on um, This Love by House Fires and turn it up, please. And the prayer team will come up. And if you need prayer tonight, you can come up to the front for prayer. I'm going to go ahead and um, let Elliot speak the blessing over you or, or however you want to do it. <laughs> Thank All you. All right. So, yeah, if that message spoke to you tonight, I know I'm not the only one it spoke to tonight. I'd encourage you to come up here. Maybe you had something against your brother this week or your sister this week. And maybe God, maybe you know that God really needs you to meet him up here tonight. I just really encourage you to come up here. Don't miss this moment. God's love is what changes around, and we got to represent him correctly. Amen? You never know. You might be the only Jesus somebody sees. So make sure that you put love on the forefront of your mind. Amen? So if you need prayer, come on up here. Every day to walk with you, to be with you, to have my eyes. my 
Is an everyday kind of love. Every morning I'm in it. This love is an everyday kind of love. Every evening I'm in it. Every evening I'm in it. This love. This love. Everyday kind of love. Every morning I'm in This love is an everyday kind of love. Every evening I'm in This love doesn't leave me. This love won't leave me cause my past is bad Oh, when this love lifts me up above the waves I don't need to be Oh, it raises me upon a rock So my feet can finally stand on ground It's every moment, every day, always His love is every moment, every day, always Love is every moment, of every day, always, always, always. This love, oh, this love is an everyday kind of love.
can finally be free Oh, and there is no chain this love can't break There is no chain this love can't break There is no chain this love can't break to be free, there is no chain this love can break. So be free, oh, and there is no chain this love can break. Be free, there is no chain this love can break. Be free, yeah. oh, there is no chain this love can break. tries to roll over my bones when sorrow tries to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know oh I won't be shaken I won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your
was a question, but we're blessed tonight. Aren't we alive. blessed? Isn't that a blessing? Praise and worship was awesome. Thank you so much, Joel, for a powerful word. Hey, now it's our job when we leave here that we apply that thing. We make sure that we remember that. Holy Spirit, I ask that you remind us of that, Lord God. Even when we wake up first thing tomorrow morning, Lord God, and help us to represent you and carry your love everywhere we go. So raise your hands and, and let's speak the blessing of you, Lord God. We thank you for tonight, Lord God. We thank you for your love that covers a multitude of sins, Lord God. And help us to see our brothers and sisters through your eyes, Lord God. That way that we can represent you and we'll bring people to you, Lord God. Ephesians 3.20. Now, unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Amen. Everybody stop by the warehouse. Have a great night. Have a good weekend. Amen.